Okay. Gospel of Mark. Now, when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 6, verse 6, the second part of verse 6 down through verse 13. And Jesus, you'll recall, he's traveling among the villages and teaching. And he sent out the 12 in pairs, giving them authority over the the demons. And he commands them to remain in the home of the, the first people that receive them. And he says that if a place will not receive them, meaning will not extend to them common hospitality or listen to their message, and they are to disassociate from them and leave them to suffer the consequences of their rejection. That's this thing about shaking the dust off your feet. Now, as Luke makes clear in Luke chapter 9, verse 6, the 12 at this time, they were preaching the gospel. Which as Jesus makes clear in Mark chapter 1 verse 15 was the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God. That's this celebratory news. This tremendous announcement of God's, of the arrival of the kingdom of God. And as Mark says in verse 12 here of this section, they preach that the people should repent which was a shorthand for the message that Jesus proclaimed in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the message that they are communicating and preaching. Now notice that Christ's death and resurrection had not yet occurred, nor had the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, and yet... They were preaching the gospel. They were announcing some great and epical news. And we talked about that early on, about what this gospel and how this term was used in the Greco-Roman world. And that news, as I've said, was that God at long last was acting to assert his sovereignty over creation in such a way as to heal its broken and sin sick state to implement his final vision for reality in which there will be no more sin, no more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. He is doing that and he's at that he's working that out and there was much more to be revealed about the way God was going to to bring that about but that didn't detract There's more to come, more to be revealed about this work of kingdom bringing in Jesus. But that didn't detract from the greatness of the news that he now was working in a unique and distinctive way toward that end. A way in which Jesus was intimately involved. And that truth demanded that people repent. That they turn from the way they had been thinking and going and they get on board with God's work in Jesus. And the disciples, ultimately, they will be brought to a realization of Jesus' identity and glory and how he was and is the turning point of all history. But they are still preaching this gospel, this announcement of this great news of God's intervention in bringing the kingdom. Now the power of the invading kingdom of God, the expression of divine sovereignty over creation, that power is represented and illustrated in the power given to these disciples by Jesus to drive out demons and heal sickness. Interestingly, these healings, they're accompanied by, here in this, in this context, by anointing with oil. You see, which presumably functions as a sign or symbol that the sick person's being set apart for God's special attention and care. Or maybe it functions as an expression of faith that the sick person will be returned to normal. But it's interesting here because you'll recall that the elders in James chapter 5 verses 14 and 15, they were called to pray over the seriously ill and to anoint them with oil. You see that same idea there in the name of the Lord. Now in in verses 14, 
6, 14 to 20. The mission of the 12, this increased the public awareness of Jesus and what he, who he is and what he's doing. So we have Jesus going out. He was a happening. And then he takes the 12 and sends them out in six pairs while he's teaching. They're out teaching. They're telling people to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is ushering in the long-awaited kingdom of God. And that increased. The public awareness of Jesus and his, acti- and his activities. And those reports came to the attention of Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, he was the, what's called the Tetrarch. He was a political ruler of the regions of Galilee and Perea from 4 B.C. to A.D. 39. Now, I say 4 B.C. because that's the date that most people accept for the death of his father, Herod the Great. But there's some debate about that. Some people want to push Herod the Great's death to to 2 B.C. or maybe 1 B.C. Well, if that's the case, then Herod Antipas wouldn't have started to rule until after that time. But most would place his rule 4 B.C. to A.D. 39. And the reference to him as king here, it says in verse 14, King Herod heard of it. Well, this reference to him as king, that was a popular designation. That wasn't his official title, that he he wasn't an official king. This is the Herod, Herod Antipas is the Herod before whom Jesus appears in Luke chapter 23. Now, Mark reports that some people thought Jesus was John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Now, they most likely meant by that, that they thought the spirit of John the Baptist was in some sense at work in Jesus. I mean, after all, Jesus and John were contemporaries, right? They had lived their lives together, so it was well known that Jesus was alive long before John died. You see, so when they're talking about that, when they're saying here that that he's John the Baptist raised from the dead, they can't be thinking that, well, there was no Jesus until John died and then came to life because they were contemporaries. So that's why I'm telling what I think they're probably saying there is that they think in some sense the spirit of John is at work in Jesus, and that seems confirmed to me by the fact that Herod showed no interest in locating John's body which if someone were claiming a resurrection, well, that would be the first thing you'd want to know. I'd want to go and find, where's this guy's body? All right, so I think this is what the people, but some people think he's John raised from the dead in that sense, that the spirit of John is at work in him. And the people apparently assume that such a return of John's spirit, that that could account for the miraculous powers at work in Jesus. Now, we know that John didn't perform miracles, but he was such a great figure that in the popular mind, they're thinking that this person, this spirit at work in Jesus, that's why he's able to do these amazing things that he's doing. So you had some people who thought along those lines. Others thought that Jesus was the prophet Elijah, whom many Jews expected to return as a herald of the coming end based on Malachi chapter 3 and Malachi chapter 4. They expected Elijah to come. And of course, John the Baptist was the Elijah who was to come. You see in Matthew eleven four, and Matthew 17, 10 to 12, he was that in that he was the herald of Jesus, the announcer of Jesus who ministered in the power, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he's the the Elijah to come in that sense. He's the proclaimer before Jesus, the herald, the announcer that he's coming, and he ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah, as you see in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And so you have some saying he's Elijah, some saying he's John the Baptist raised from the dead, and others speculated that he was a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. Just some great, powerful Man of God. Now, Herod, Herod Antipas, he thinks or fears that it's option one. See, he fears that Jesus is in some way John the Baptist, whom he had beheaded. You see, so he's a little concerned about this. 
that it's John the Baptist. Now others, so he's thinking, now Mark presents the death of John as a flashback. You see, like people, we have TV shows where you're preventing a story. Well, that's how he presents the death of John. In this situation, he then flashes back. Herod Antipas arrested John because John was telling him that his marriage to Herodias, now Herodias had been the wife of Herod Antipas' brother Philip. And so they got divorced, and he then married her. And John was telling this powerful political figure, it is not lawful for you to have, have her as your wife. And you can see that didn't earn him many points. He was telling him that. See, the law forbid a man from marrying his brother's wife. You see that in Leviticus 18, 16, and 20 to 21, except in the case of a leveret marriage, where a person's, where the, the person dies and he leaves no children. Well, then you had the situation where the brother would then continue his line. But that wasn't the case that we're looking at here. So according to Matthew 14, verses 3 to 5, Herod wanted to kill John. Okay, so he, he originally he wanted to kill him. But he settled for arresting him because he feared the people who considered that John was a prophet. So you know how politicians work. You always got to have cover for stuff. You can't let your stuff be out there for what it really is. So he's afraid that if I do this, the people will react. So he has to settle for having him arrested. Then presumably, after he wants to kill him, he can't politically, he arrests him. And then presumably his interaction with John after his arrest caused him to recognize and to appreciate that John was somebody special. So though he wanted to kill him initially, he arrests him, and then he seems to have a change of heart, presumably based on his interaction with John. Now Mark says that Herodias, his wife resented John and wanted to kill him. But Herod is now, he's afraid of John, because he's come to some conviction that, hmm, there's something at work in this guy, and I'm a little nervous about it. Okay, so he's come, to, he's afraid of him, knowing that he's a righteous and holy man. And so he kept his wife Herodias from realizing her intentions to kill him. Indeed, Herod liked listening to John, even though he was baffled by the things John said, and I'm sure he was, because here's this worldly political hack. And he's in here and he's talking to one of these spiritual people who God is using here. And so he's going, hmm, I don't really understand what he's saying. I don't doubt that for a second. Now Herodias, she got her opportunity at Herod's birthday party. When her daughter pleased Herod so much with her dance that he told her, and I suspect alcohol was involved. He told her that he would give her up to half of his kingdom. Okay, he, he would give her whatever she wanted, up to half of her kingdom. Now, this was a hyperbolic way. Okay, it's simply an exaggerated way of saying she could make a big request of him and he would grant it. But there was no doubt a socially understood limitation on what you could request. In other words, he's saying, listen, look, I'm, I'm willing to do a big deal for you. But socially, it would be understood, you don't really ask for half of this kingdom. That's not what this is about. And if you did that, everyone would recognize that you had acted improperly, okay, and out of the cultural norm. So when you hear that, you say, boy, that's pretty crazy. No, I, I think that's what's going on. It's simply a hyperbolic way of saying, I will grant a large request of yours, it being understood that there are limitations on what you can request, or the whole society will look at you as, boy, how dare you, you see? And they wouldn't look at me and say, well, you said you'd give half his thing. Everybody understood what that meant, okay? So he says that now. He, he, so she can get, ask him something large, and after consulting with her mother, she immediately, it says, with haste, Meaning, she wanted to get back while the guests were still present. 
Okay, so he couldn't weasel because he had made this in front of the guests, so she wants them there to put the pressure on him to go through with it. So she goes back in haste and she asks Herod for John's head on a platter. This is what she wants. Now, though distressed by the request, Herod chose to have the righteous John beheaded rather than lose face with his guests. That, that's, that's what he chose. He chose to have this man he knew was a righteous, holy man to have him beheaded rather than have people think he was a punk. And so he goes through with that. Now that's quite a contrast, isn't it, to the moral courage of John? The man he murdered? You think about John. John was willing to stand up for truth in the face of this great political power and tell this guy, it is not right for you to have Herodias as your wife. Do you know who I am? I do know who you are. But the truth is, it's not lawful for you to have her. Now you contrast that moral courage to this guy who's having, his, who's having John's head lopped off. But when John's disciples learned of what had happened, they took his body and they laid it in a tomb, giving him an honorable burial. And then in 630 to 36, the apostles return. And they report to Jesus the exorcisms and healings they had done and the teaching that they had presented. And according to Luke chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, they then went into or toward the town of Bethsaida. They go into or toward the town of Bethsaida, which probably is near the northern shore, the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, just east of the Jordan River. You remember how the Jordan comes down through the Sea of Galilee? And up the north, just east of the Jordan, on the northern tip, that's probably where Bethsaida was. And the crowds that followed them there, you see from Luke chapter 9, verse 11, they made it impossible for them even to eat. You see here in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. And realizing that the disciples, they needed some rest and some recuperation from their mission. They had been out going all over the place in pairs, telling people to repent because the kingdom of God is being ushered in in the life and ministry of Jesus. And so this is a lot to do. And all of the healings and things, and you see the kind of emotional strain and pressure that this brings. So they've been out doing that, and Jesus recognizes that they need some rest and recuperation. They've got crowds now in Bethsaida that are on them so much they can't eat. So they need a breather. They need a break of some kind. So Jesus decided to sail with them down the coast to a sparsely inhabited region on the northeast of the sea. So, so Bethsaida is up at the north point. He's going to, I'll go this way, north point. He's going to sail down along the coast over to the northeast shore and go there to some, to some sparsely inhabited region. Now Luke, in his account, he omits the boat journey. Remember, Luke said they're going to, toward, or into Bethsaida. But he omits the boat journey, but it's clear from chapter 9, verse 12 of the Gospel of Luke, that they're no longer near Bethsaida. Okay, so they have in fact gone where Mark says they've gotten in a boat and they've gone. But the crowds, you see, the crowds see them getting in the boat and sailing from the north over to the northeast coast to this sparsely populated area. And they run along the shore. They've watched them and they charge along. And I think I've got a slide here. Yeah, you see, so here they're up in Bethsaida and he's going to take them over to this region. They're just going to sail over here where there aren't people. But the crowd see them and they just go charging along and they wind up going there where, where they are. And so this is, this is what happens. Back to, yeah. So when they landed, Jesus sees a large crowd that had come from there and it says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, these Israelites weren't being adequately directed 
and protected by Israel's leaders. And therefore, they were vulnerable to being, to being scattered and devoured. And Jesus, of course, he's the great shepherd. That's what you see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. And thus, he expresses his compassion on this crowd that is not being adequately taught and shepherded by the leaders of Israel. He expresses his compassion on them by teaching them many things. I don't think we usually make that connection. We don't think that teaching people, that's not really an exercise of compassion. Building homes for people, that's being compassionate. Helping homeless people with food or whatever, that's being compassionate. But it looks to me like Jesus is having compassion on these people who are like sheep without a shepherd by teaching them and undoubtedly teaching them about the kingdom of God. You see, that's what, that's what he's doing and having compassion on them. Now, late in the day, the disciples, they urge Jesus to send the crowd away. You've got this huge crowd of people that have come here. And they urge Jesus to send the crowd away so they could go buy something to eat in the villages in the surrounding countryside. There's a ton of people here. And you're going to have to dismiss them so they will have time to go out and find something to eat. And then Jesus answered in 637, he says, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Now, that's not an instruction to to them to perform a miracle. They certainly didn't understand it that way. Rather, the fact they think the crowd has to be sent away, that indicates a lack of appreciation on their part for the Lord's power. Oh, no, well, I mean, there are certain things, you know, I've seen you do some things, but you know what? We got a lot of people here, so the only option available is they have to be dismissed so they can go out and buy food in the villages. They do not understand the power that is at work and is inherent in the Lord Jesus. So this statement, see, when he says, you give them something to eat, that seems clearly to be an allusion to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 to 44, where the prophet Elisha told his servant to feed a hundred men with 20 loaves of barley and some fresh ears of grain. Elisha tells his servant, you feed a hundred men with just 20 loaves and some ears of grain. And the servant was baffled how so many could be expected to eat so little. And the prophet Elisha said, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. Then in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 44, it says, So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. Now Jesus' direction to them, you give them something to eat, it was designed to bring that prior miracle to their mind. He was trying to cue them in. They say, you know, we're in a situation now that the only answer is they're going to have to go. He says, you give them something to eat. Does that sound familiar to you? You give them something. You know the Old Testament, don't you? You understand that it is not unprecedented that by the power of the Lord, many have eaten from just a little. But what do the disciples do? As they do oftentimes, they miss the point. They miss the point and they complain that a food run. We're going to have to go get takeout. And that a food run, for so many people, they said it would cost 200 denarii. That's over six months wages for a laborer. And they're thinking, surely you don't expect us to spring for that, do you? You're not expecting us to go get takeout and spend that much money. So they missed the point, of course, 
And Jesus has the disciples. He then has them confirm the limited amount of food that's available. There's only five loaves. Now, this is probably pita-sized flatbread. It's about eight inches in diameter and about an inch thick. So they've got five of those little things, and they've got two fish that are dried or smoked. So he has them confirm the limited amount of food there, and then he tells the people to sit on the green grass in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he says a blessing, probably meaning that he praised God. And he breaks the bread, gives it to the disciples to set before the crowd. And he defy, divides the fish. And then the miracle, it's reported just matter-of-factly. The miracle is reported in verse 42. They all ate and were satisfied. But just, you know, I mean, hey, we, we, got, we got all of these people here. We've only got five loaves, two fish. Jesus says, you don't remember what happened, do you? He says, bring it over here. Thanks, God. Breaks it, divides it. Everybody's eating. Everybody's eating. Going, hmm, boy, that seemed wild. How is that happening? And as in the account of Elisha, so much food was provided that there were leftovers. You see, if there weren't leftovers, then you'd be saying, well... It wasn't, enough wasn't provided that everybody could eat their fill. You see, the fact leftovers, of course, you know, we have so much food, we leave leftovers all the time. But this, for people who don't have a lot of food and who are hungry, when you're leaving leftovers, baby, that means I've eaten all I can eat. And that's the significance of the leftovers. The leftovers show the magnitude of provision that from this little amount, he completely satisfied the appetite of all of the people gathering. It's all the more impressive given the number, that the number of men who ate, this isn't counting the women and children, 5,000. 5,000. Now, presumably, the crowd is unaware of how the food had been provided. Otherwise, you'd expect their amazement to be recorded by Mark. Well, you know, they're in this big crowd. I don't think they knew. But we know. The apostles knew that here's the Lord doing this tremendous miracle. Now, in, in 45 to 52, Jesus sent the disciples in the boat back to the region of Bethsaida. So remember, they'd been there, all the, the people here, they couldn't even eat. They needed some time off. He sails over here. The crowd chases him over there. Then we have this feeding of the 5,000. He now gets them in the boat and sends them back toward Bethsaida. He dismissed the crowd. And then he goes up in the hills to pray. And during the evening, before the full darkness of the night, the disciples' boat was toward the middle of the sea. Now see, that description, that may suggest that it's off course for Bethsaida. Because... You see here, he's sending them back from this region, back to Bethsaida, but they're out here. You see, so they're out in the middle. And so they're off course for Bethsaida, having, you know, having been, as we'll see, the, they're struggling against the wind. And that seems confirmed, you see, when hours later, Jesus then sees them, whether he sees them at that time supernaturally, or whether he sees them that time by moonlight, he sees them struggling against the wind to make headway back to Bethsaida. So this idea, he sees them first, they're out there, there's this nasty wind that's fighting them and keeping them from getting there. Now, around the fourth watch of the night, which begins around 3 a.m., Jesus came out to them walking on the water. I got to pause here, a little footnote. Many years ago, I was having lunch with a guy I used to work with, and he was telling me, he actually said to me, no, if Jesus came here, he'd have to sink in the water. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about, man? I said, no, he'd have to, he'd have to abide by the laws of nature. I said, he, he creates this stuff. What, what are you telling me? 
But, they, you know, so it's, you get into those kinds of things. Sometimes you're like, you know, you're looking at things from such a different perspective. I'm thinking, like, have you lost your mind? That he would have to. Anyway, but here, here Jesus comes out here. and He walks on the water toward them. Now, the phrase at the end of verse 48, that he was wanting to pass by them. Now, that seems pretty curious, doesn't it? I mean, that, that seems odd, given the implication in the first part of verse 48, that he was motivated to go out to them because they were having difficulty. And given the statement in the middle of verse 48, that he went out to them. Okay, so, I mean, why go out to them and then desire to pass by them? I mean, right, you say, well, what's up with that? Well, it's likely that by that this phrase, pass by them, it's likely that that's an allusion to the Old Testament. Specifically, Exodus 33, 17 through 34, 8, where God revealed his glory, what? In passing by Moses. And you see the same idea in 1 Kings 19, verses 10 and 12 with Elijah. In other words, I think what's going on is that Jesus came to them wanting to exhibit to them through the miracle of his walking on the water the glory of God that is inherent in him. Here he is. I mean, you know, he's feeding multitudes with nothing. He's telling demons, get out. He's giving the ability to do that to other people. So I think he's wanting to show the glory of God that is inherent in him. Now, when the disciples saw this unrecognized person approaching on the water, they were terrified. Because, you know, unlike how our culture likes to portray people of some thousands years ago, that they're all brutish and morons, they knew quite well that objects of mass sink in water. And so here comes this unrecognized person walking on the water. So they're going, hmm, ghost, spirit, something without mass that is walking on here. And they're absolutely terrified. They just are terrified of that because they believe it's this spirit. And then Jesus identified himself. He told them not to be afraid. He got into the boat, and when he did so, what happened? The wind against which they had been struggling all night just stops. I mean, it's just, you know, just think of this. Just think of being around and seeing this. I'm getting a signal here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Bernard's like my third base coach. He's over here. He's, he's waving me in. <laughs> Thank you, bro. All right, so the disciples, they're just floored. They're floored, and Mark says the reason was that they didn't understand about the loaves. Why are they floored when Jesus comes walking on the water and gets in the boat and the winds die? The reason is, is they didn't understand about the loaves. See, despite that very recent, mind-blowing miracle, that Jesus had just done, they still didn't re realize Jesus' true significance and his power. The revelation of God in Jesus, that he is God incarnate. He is the God-man. And they still didn't recognize that. They didn't understand that. Their hearts were hardened. See, not in the sense of being hostile to the Lord, but in the sense of not being fully open to Jesus as the unique manifestation of God. Not being open to Jesus as God in the flesh. You see, they're seeing him. He's a rabbi, he's a teacher, he's a miracle worker, he's doing great things. But they still have not grasped who Jesus really is. They didn't let the great miracle have its full impact in shaping their understanding of who Jesus is. They've still got a ways to go. Now in chapter 6, 53 to 56, after Jesus joined them in the boat, 
they proceeded then, instead of going to Bethsaida, they go to Gennesaret, to, which is on the west coast of the sea. So it seems there's been a change, and presumably their having been blown off course out into the middle of the sea was part of that change. You can see again here, the map, they were going here, they're out in the middle, he walks out, and then they wind up coming over to the western shore here of Gennesaret. And so they go there. Now the people there, they recognized him immediately. I mean, he'd been ministering around here. He comes over there, they recognize him, they recognize him immediately, and they spread the word, and he's followed everywhere by people bringing their sick to him and begging him to let them just touch the fringe of his garment. Just touch the fringe, fringe of his garment. And so mighty, so mighty is Jesus' healing power, a power that will be exercised fully and globally when the kingdom of God is consummated at Jesus' return. But here, he's so mighty in healing power that everyone who touched his fringe was healed. Now this is something. All these people who are suffering and struggling, no modern medicine to help you with anything, which is a gift of God, by the way. But then they wind up and they just, just please let us, touching the fringe of his clothing, healed, healed, healed. You know, again, in the words of Buffalo Springfield, there's something happening here. Something's going on. Something's definitely going on. Now, in chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, we have some Pharisees and experts in the law who come from Jerusalem. Now, it's not clear whether he means that both groups came from Jerusalem or only one of them came from Jerusalem. But in any event, uh, one or, or both groups come from Jerusalem, which is the center of opposition to Jesus. And they saw some of Jesus' disciples eating food, literally it says loaves, eating with unclean hands, meaning that they were not ritually washed before they ate. Now, the Mosaic law, it required priests to wash their hands before entering the tent of meeting and offering sacrifices. You see that in Exodus chapter 30, uh, 20 and 21, 40, 12, and 30, verses 30 to 32. But there was a long-standing oral tradition. There was a long-standing oral tradition that extended that requirement to all Israel before they ate. It's not in Scripture, but it was a long-standing oral tradition. And the Pharisees considered this tradition of the elders, this long-standing oral tradition, they considered it to be fully authoritative. You see, they, they put it on the par with the written word, even claiming that this oral tradition that they honored, that it had originated with Moses. And the practice of hand washing before eating, it was widely observed among Jews in the first century. So this is what's happening, and they come and they see his disciples eating without going through this ritual washing that the oral law required. And Mark says literally in verse 3 that they do not eat unless they wash the hands with or to or by a fist. In other words, it's what's called a dative form of that noun, which can mean with, to, or by, and to, with to or by a fist. And so you can see why it's, it's puzzled translators. The meaning is unclear, which why some translations say they wash their hands in a special way. Or they wash their hands ritually. Or they wash their hands thoroughly. Or they wash their hands carefully. Or they wash their hands properly. Okay, it's just because in a, 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 we're not sure. What does that mean, with or by or to a fist? And so those are the best shots at what he was trying to communicate. Now he adds in verse 4, 
that when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. And here he literally, he uses the word immerse. He says, unless they wash themselves, presumably because in the marketplace, you see, it's very easy to come into contact with a ritually defiling person or a thing. Because there's a lot of people here you don't know. You don't know where they've gone, what they've done. They're handling stuff. You're touching stuff. And so they wash, he says, after coming from the marketplace. Now, the switch of that verb, by the way, to immerse, that could be an indication that what he's talking about is that they, they would immerse themselves after going to the marketplace in a ritual pool called a mikvah. That they would come and immerse themselves in that pool uh, after there, after going to the marketplace. But Mark notes that they hold to other traditions regarding the washing of various objects such as cups and pitchers and copper utensils. And he possibly says dining couches. I say possibly because there's a textual issue. It's not clear whether that was part of the original gospel of Mark. Okay, it may well not be. But anyway, you see he's, he's alerting these people, these Christians in Rome, about these Jewish practices. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, they asked Jesus to defend the conduct of his disciples in breaking the tradition of the elders, this oral law, by eating with unwashed hands. And Jesus gives them two responses. He says in verses 6 through 8 that they're hypocrites. He says they're hypocrites to whom Isaiah's condemnation in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, well applies. He says, they offer God mere lip service while elevating their own traditions above the commands of God. Points that he then develops in verses 9 through 13. In, in verses 9 through 13, he rebukes them for rejecting God's commandment in order to observe their own tradition. He said, you people got traditions that contradict what God is saying, and you wind up elevating your tradition over God's word. And so he tells them that. Exhibit A is their rejecting of God's command to honor one's mother and father which you see in Exodus 20:12, Deuteronomy chapter 5:16, which involves caring for the parents' physical needs in their old age. You see indeed honoring one's parents was so important that failing to honor your parent by slandering, reviling or cursing them, it was subject to the death penalty. Honoring your parents was that important? And yet the scribes and Pharisees reject the obligation to care for aging parents by teaching that a man who pledges some of his wealth as korban, okay, as a gift devoted to God, is no longer allowed to use that part of his assets to care for his parents, even though that property he had pledged remained at his disposal throughout his life. So in other words, he says, I give this to God. I still get to use it in these things. But when I'm dead, it passes for that use. So even though he still gets to use it, they said, once you designated that as Korban, it was off limits for you to spend in the care of your parents. Now, there was some disagreement about this. There were some rabbis who argued for an exception to the Korban oath. They said, no, well, that's true, but if it caused hardships for one's parents, I heard that bell, then the oath could be uh, done away with. But there were others who had said it was inviolable. No, if you've pledged that, then you had to go ahead through it. And this essentially, see, nullifies the command to care, to honor your parents, to care for your aging parents. It nullifies that for the sake of their tradition. And Jesus adds that you do many things like that. You have created traditions that contradict what God has called you to do, and you elevate them. 
Instead of doing what God said, you follow your tradition. And that's not how it's to be. Now, unfortunately, I heard that second bell. Thanks for coming.